about you to mark in your book our invitation song will be number 71. 71 will be our song at the invitation. For our lesson this evening, we'll sing number 186. 186. We can't sing this one sitting down, so I would invite you to stand. 186. Turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to notice a brief and familiar section out of that chapter as a basis of our study together this evening. I thought when we first got in here tonight that it was so hot in here that I was going to have to cut it extremely short in order to survive, but now they've got it cooled down so I can just keep on going, I guess. <clears throat> All right. All right. We do have a few of our people who are missing tonight, Brother uh, Tate Williams is speaking out at Tallapoosa, I believe, tonight, and some of those people have gone out there with him, and that's good that he is able and capable and willing to do that kind of thing. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Then he said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. His application was then, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. These two sections, chapter 5, verse 13, and then verses 14 through 16, are often used as passages that we use them to teach the principle of influence, how we are to be that, that preserving influence in a, in a world that is given over to the ways of Satan. And as the light of the world, we are to show people who are in darkness the way out of light by living the Christian life. Those are general principles that are involved in that particular context. But in our study tonight, I would like to make a specific application of that thought. 
We are to be an influence in the world in which we live. When we think about influence, we must also think about the fact that we do have to endure various problems in life. And when we think about those problems, we think about tests. Tests of our lives, and we've often raised the question, how can we know how strong our faith is until it is tested? As long as everything is going well, as long as everything's going our way, there's really not much trying of our faith. But yet you'll recall that James wrote the trying of your faith worketh patience, and then he goes on to explain further aspects of that. Life is filled with tests. Life is filled with circumstances where our faith is tried. And when we think about life in that regard, how we handle the problems of life. When we think about that concept, who should have a more powerful influence in this world than the child of God in handling the problems of life? You think about the life of Paul in which he would say, Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. If you were to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23, Paul would talk about the various difficulties that he faced in life, and, and he listed a number of perils that he had to face in life. Those perils did not discourage him to the point of ever giving up on carrying the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. There were times when his life was on the line. He talked about being stoned. He talked about being a shipwreck. He talked about being a night and a, a day in the deep. There were so many very difficult circumstances in Paul's life. And yet even from a prison cell he would write, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Who better then to show the world in which you and I live how to deal with the problems of life than the child of God? To be what God wants us to be and to do what God wants us to do regardless of the difficulties that come our way. Now think about those thoughts with Matthew 5, 16 in mind. Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. They may see how you handle the problems of life and thereby exert an influence on those around us that they cannot see anywhere else. Problems are going to come difficulties we will have to face in life. In John chapter 16, and of course chapters 14, 15, 16, Jesus is preparing the apostles for his departure. He has worked with them now some three plus years, training them, if you please, preparing them to be those to carry the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. They were trained in that which is right. They were trained to follow in the steps of the Savior. His work would be left in their hands. And in getting ready to leave them in chapter 16 and in verse 33, he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. How encouraging would that be to those apostles to, to hear him say, you know, I, I'm about to leave you, I'm going to leave you in this world, and in this world you're going to have tribulation. That within itself would not be too encouraging, would it? But then he says to them, be of good cheer. There's, there's reason to be of a different mindset than to allow the concept of tribulations to get you down. Why? He said, I have overcome the world. 
And it is through Christ tonight that we can overcome the world. So we will have tribulation. We will have difficulties. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul would say to the young evangelist Timothy, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It is not always easy to live the Christian life in a world filled with sin. And occasionally we find ourselves in circumstances that, that may trouble us as to how we will handle those situations in life. It shouldn't be strange to us. It shouldn't catch us off guard that we're going to suffer because we've already been told that we will. But sometimes those situations just creep up on us unexpectedly. We have one to help us through those difficulties. In 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with about verse 14, Peter said, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. What's he saying? We can overcome the problems, the difficulties, the trials and tribulations that we face. We recently studied James chapter 1 and verse 2, in which James encouraged brethren to count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, and there the word tribulation is a more accurate rendering. The trials and the tribulations that we face in life, we're going to face them. They will come. How we handle them is the real issue. Not whether or not they'll come, but how we will handle them when they will. I want you to notice a passage that we usually don't think about. I, I, I don't think we think about it in this regard. Matthew chapter 7. In verse 21 beginning, Jesus simply said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. <clears throat> and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Usually we use those last three or four verses to talk about building upon a proper foundation. And that is clearly taught within that context. Jesus Christ is the foundation upon which we must build our lives. But did you notice that when you build upon the proper foundation, you are able to withstand the storms of life. When he talks about the rain descending, the floods coming, the winds blowing, and they beat upon that house, what is he saying? There are storms of life that come our way. There are those difficult times that come our way. We will face them. How we handle them will in large depend upon the foundation upon which we build. If we're built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we should be able to withstand those storms of life. We're not building upon Jesus Christ, then we'll have difficulty in that regard. But do you think about this life? We live in mortal flesh. We are moving toward death, every single one of us. How are we dealing with that? Well, the world sometimes doesn't deal with that so well. But as children of God living in this life, living in the flesh, headed toward death, 
ought to be looking forward to the time that we will be able to go home and be with the Father. Paul himself said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in those recent um, murders that we talked about in, in Mississippi, you know, that was the one verse that stuck out, in, stuck out in my mind when I thought about that couple who had been murdered. Exactly what Paul said, for that couple having the hope that we have based upon their life, that death to them was gain. That's the way the child of God looks at life and death. Yes, it is a struggle to live here. Oh, there are so many spiritual blessings that we enjoy in this life. Paul mentioned some of those in Ephesians chapter 1 when he says all spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ. And he talks about reconciliation. He talks about redemption. He talks about forgiveness. There are so many spiritual blessings that we enjoy in life. But in spite of those spiritual blessings, there are difficulties, problems, trials, tribulations that we have to face. And so to the child of God getting through all of that and ultimately being with God when this life is over is indeed gain. You'll recall on another occasion, Paul said, I'm in a strait betwixt two. If you want to put that in old Mississippi language where I came from, I'm between a rock and a hard place. What was his dilemma? I have a desire to depart and to be with God. But he said, for me to remain is more needful for you. Paul's real desire was to, to be relieved of the trials and the tribulations and the burdens of this life and to be with God where he would be eternally. Now, ultimately, he would gain that, wouldn't he? You'll recall in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 that there's a crown of life that awaits every one of us. It is incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. For every single one of us, there is a crown of life that is reserved in heaven. And as we've often stated, the only thing that can keep you from getting that crown of life is your own unfaithfulness to God. There is no other power able to cause you to lose that crown of life. And so as we look through Paul's life and, and we see how he faced the difficulties that came his way, that was his attitude. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Yes, we're often affected by the actions and the sins of others. And sometimes we try to use that as an excuse for our own shortcomings, but <clears throat> those are not adequate excuses. You see, the child of God is not immune even from natural disaster. You know, a, a tornado comes through a given area. It doesn't always skirt around the children of God in that community, does it? They're affected by it. How do we deal with that kind of thing? That says a lot about the foundation upon which we're building. And so the Christian is the most qualified person on the face of the earth to handle the problems of life. They're coming. Mark it down. We will have them. But how will we handle them? Now, some problems are unavoidable. Some problems are avoidable. One of the things that we have noticed early on in our study of the Proverbs in our auditorium class on Wednesday evening is that knowledge and wisdom and understanding, that is, knowledge of God's Word, the wisdom to use that Word, the understanding of, of how it really affects me in my life, can help us avoid some difficulties in life. Length of days will be ours to enjoy. And so we need to realize that, that as we study and learn God's Word and, and apply that Word to our life, it will help us avoid many of the problems of life. 
but then you see in the world heartbreak and suffering as the result of sexual immorality versus purity of life. You see, there's a way to avoid that in our life, but we don't always do that, do we? We sometimes do not avoid what could be avoided, the ravages and the sufferings of, of the, the body's abuse of drugs and alcohol and tobacco as a result of, of those things versus the abstinence of those things. What we choose to do or not do in our fleshly bodies can help us avoid or bring upon us some of the problems that life has to offer. But not all of them are avoidable. We can be faced with a lot of difficulties that are not of our own doing. But because of our faith, because of our courage, because of our determination as children of God, we can face those things much like we mentioned with Paul. We're not alone. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews writer would say, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men shall do unto me. You see, that's where the child of God is coming from in dealing with the problems of life. I have the Lord as my helper. Whatever men do unto me cannot overcome what the Lord can do through me and for me in difficult times. Again, in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14 through uh, the following verses, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Now one of the things that you'll find throughout the book of Hebrews is a letter of encouragement for those Hebrew Christians who were facing much difficulty in life by, by means of persecution. The writer is trying to get them, don't turn back to where you were. Stay faithful, stay, stay steadfast in your Christian life. And so he says in that regard, <coughs> hold fast our profession. Now look at what he says next. Four. Here's how we can hold fast the profession of our faith when difficulties come. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Have you ever faced anything in life to which you reacted? I can't believe that anybody else has ever faced this before. You know, sometimes our difficulties are so great that we can't imagine that anybody has ever had to go through anything like that before. We better read, hadn't we? We have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who is in the heavens. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is the Hebrew writer saying? You don't have to face these problems alone. You don't have to face the difficulties of life alone. You have a high priest. You have one in heaven who can feel what you're feeling when you're going through these kinds of difficulties. And if we'll just come boldly to the throne of grace, he says you can find mercy and you can find grace to help in time of need. I think of Peter's advice when he talked about the devil as an adversary walking about seeking whom he may devour, he said, casting all your care on him, on God, for he careth for you. He cares for us. 
He'll help us through. He'll see us through these difficult times. So there is strength and encouragement in passages like these from heaven itself to help us through the difficulties of life. Not only that, <coughs> but you'll recall, no doubt, Galatians chapter 6, in which Paul there says, Brethren, verse 1 beginning, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, what's happened here? Here is a brother or sister in Christ, as the case may be, who has been overcome by temptation. They've been overtaken in a fault. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Not only do we have help in difficult times from heaven itself, from that great high priest who is there. But we also have help from brethren. In verse 2 of that same context, Galatians 6, Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You'll recall in Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he talked about God being the God of all comfort, wherewith he comforteth us. And then he goes on in that same context and encourages the brethren in Corinth to comfort one another with the comfort wherewith they have been comforted. What's he say? We've received help. We've received comfort from heaven. Now we in turn can be of help and strength and encouragement to others who are having difficulties in life. So not only do we have help from heaven, we have help from our own brethren in that regard. So when we think about the problems of life and, and we think about the example that we're setting and, and how we deal with the various problems that we face, giving up, quitting, growing slack is not the answer how we deal with the difficulties. Let me share one thought with you from the, from the events and the funeral of the couple that was murdered. Their son, Tom, is a faithful gospel preacher, very dear friend of ours. And, and after the service was over, <clears throat> Tom got up to make some closing remarks. He thanked the ladies of the church for food, and he thanked the law enforcement officials for the professional way they handle the situation, and a lot of things like that. But he began, and there were people from the community there, but he began by making a plea to those present, have respect to the family of the man who was responsible for my parents' death. How many of us would have thought of that? You know, the anger, the rage that, that goes into the situation. Who would, have any, who would want to have anything to do with that family? It's not the family's fault. But how he handled that. I heard several people comment, my, what a, what a reaction that is. You see, here's a child of God who has just lost both parents. But here he is making a plea to those present and the people of the community. Here's how we want you to help us handle this problem. Show your respect to that family. I just thought that was an awesome thought. But what else would you expect from a child of God? What else would you expect? Marvelous way. Not quitting, not giving up, but depending on help from above to deal with the problems of life. So in that regard, it just simply says to us, we know that, that problems are coming. There's no doubt about that. Some are avoidable, some are not. Knowing that some are coming that are avoidable, what ought we to do? We ought to so fortify ourselves with the Word of God that we can deal with them when they do and escape the pitfalls of those troubles trials and tribulations. For those that we can't avoid, those that we have to face, we need to fortify our faith 
while things are well, preparing for the storms of life that will come. You're familiar with Ephesians chapter 6, in which Paul would write, beginning with verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. What's he saying? Prepare yourself. Fortify yourself. And as we so often point out, every piece of Christian armor in Ephesians chapter 6 is directly connected to the Word of God. Every single piece of armor. And so we fortify ourselves. We strengthen our faith through a study of the Word of God and, and allowing that Word to dwell richly in us. And then when those troubles come, we can deal with it. We need to show the world what it means to have strength and courage and faith of a consecrated, dedicated child of God in the storms of life. And we can do it. And so when you think about that passage in Matthew chapter 5, yes, it, it simply says to us that we need to set the proper example in, in every aspect of life, whatever it is. But I wanted us to focus in on this one aspect of life. When trouble comes, when difficulties are ours to face, if we have so fortified ourselves, we can show the world how a child of God deals with the problems of life, and it's not like the world, like only a child of God can react. But there may be those here tonight who are not children of God, and you need to take care of that first. That needs to be your primary concern. If your faith in Jesus Christ would lead you to turn away from a life of sin, confess that faith, you can be buried with your Lord in baptism. You can become a child of God, a new creature in Christ. And then whatever difficulties you face in life, you've got God on your side, you've got faithful brethren on your side, you can overcome through Jesus Christ. If you're a child of God and you've wandered away, you don't have that help at your disposal because you have alienated yourself from the Father and from the benefits of the Father's home. Why don't you come back home like that prodigal son? God is waiting to receive you back. And if we can assist you tonight in being what you need to be in order to overcome the difficulties of life, let us encourage you to respond to the Lord's invitation as we stand together and sing this song.
Sister Sue has responded to the Lord's invitation this evening, uh, simply stating that, of course, and, and we all are aware of the, a lot of the difficulties involved with Sister Rosemary and, and trying to decide what's best for her and whatever, and uh, Sue just says, I need God's help in making wise decisions and going in the right direction and doing, doing the things that need to be done. And there's a lot involved in that, and certainly we respect her desires in that regard to be able to do what's right. She said that, of course, a lot of the brethren here have been very supportive, and she is, she is grateful for that. And that if she's done anything wrong that has affected anybody in that regard, then she asks your forgiveness in that regard as well. Certainly we all have decisions to make in life, and sometimes those decisions are easier. Some are easier than others. Some are more complicated than others. And I remember the statement of James when he said, If any lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And that's her desire. So would you go with me in prayer to our Father. Gracious and loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we have Thee as our Father, that we can call upon Thee in difficult times in our lives, knowing that, that You'll hear our prayer and that You'll answer those petitions in harmony with Thy will and the best interest of Thy children. Father, we're mindful of, of Sue at this time and all of the things that are going on in her life with regard to the care and the keeping of, of Sister Rosemary. And Father, we pray that you would give her wisdom to know the right direction and the strength and the courage to go that direction. And we pray, Father, that as brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever way that we can be of assistance, we will help her bear those burdens that will be hers to bear. And Father, we are mindful of her request relative to the forgiveness of any sin that may be in her life in this regard or otherwise. That as she is willing to repent of those things and acknowledge them, that we know Thou wilt indeed forgive her of those sins. Father, we would simply pray that You would help all of us to be wise in the decisions we have to make on a daily basis not only in the care and keeping of others, as is her case, but, Father, help each of us to make good decisions that will be in our own best interest spiritually in our relationship with Thee. Help us, Father, to realize our shortcomings. Help us to realize our dependence upon Thee. And help us to realize, Father, that in Thee we have help and strength and encouragement to always do that which is right. We're so thankful for thy Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, who was willing to die for us, to enable us to be free from the guilt of sin, and through whom we can come boldly to thy throne of grace, to find that grace and mercy, and to obtain help in time of need. And that's our prayer for Sue at this time, and for all of us. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. We should all be thankful for the word of God and the power of it. And men like Sidney who can proclaim it so well and so eloquently. For all others who had a public part in our worship service today, we're thankful for your efforts. For those that are visiting, you are a welcome guest. We invite you back at your next opportunity, which will be Wednesday night at 7 o'clock when we uh, saints here at Bremen will meet again Wednesday night. Again, for those that are on our prayer list, I wish to bring those to your attention. Noah Wilson was doing better. He was here this morning. I assume he's still doing okay and recovering from a tonsillectomy. There he is. Frank Presley, Stephen Joyce's son, had knee surgery, and he's laid up at home, but hopefully he will be continuing to improve slowly. 
You're asked to, to continue to remember Vesta Carroll, who is now at home out of the hospital but still not doing well. Rosemary Evans continues at uh, the nursing home in Douglasville, and right now she's doing pretty well. Addie Hunt also is still at home, and she's uh, back home from the hospital. We should remember her. Joan Thurman was able to be here this morning. She seemed as if she was feeling some better. Barbara Cron also, again, with us tonight. I thought I saw her. There she is. So if you uh, have yet to tell her how good it is to see her out, please do so. Shirley Smallwood, however, is not able to be out. She's really struggling right now, and anything we can do to help her and encourage her, I'm sure would certainly be welcome. You're asked to remember Janet Young Watson, who's undergoing several radiation treatments for cancer, and that will be ongoing for several weeks. Jimmy Brandon also is not feeling well. He's been at home for the past two or three Sundays, and we should remember him also. Marlene Bilyeu, who recently placed membership here with us at Bremen, we just learned, was in the hospital, and um, hopefully she's going home today. Was that the last report? I think that's the case. Going home today from intensive care at uh, Tanner. So when we have opportunities to call on her, I'm sure that would be welcome as well. Are there others that we should mention? Gospel meetings in the area. There's one that begins next week at Villa Rica. Brother Neil Pollard is the speaker, April 10th through Thursday, April 14th. The week after that, gospel meeting at West Georgia, April 17th through 21, Dave Leonard, the speaker. Gospel meeting here at Bremen will be April 24th through 28, Brother Chris Clevenger, the speaker. We will have a, a door knocking campaign that Thursday. Friday and Saturday leading up to the event. We will have um, the students and some of the faculty of the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies here to help us in that effort. Uh, if we don't yet have one, we'll have a sign-up list soon for those who wish to help us in these door-knocking campaigns. Again, there'll be Thursday, Friday, Saturday leading up to the event, and perhaps also some that we can do on uh, Monday and Tuesday. The students will leave on Tuesday. We'll have a little bit more detail for you concerning those events, but for those who wish to help us, we would very much like for you to do so. In connection with that, the deacons are asked to meet with the elders next Sunday afternoon at 4.30. Deacons, meet with the elders, please, next Sunday at 4.30 so we can do some planning for our upcoming events. Two weeks from today, April 17, will be the last to lead send-off party after the evening service. Brothers Keepers Groups 1 and 2 will host the party and have cake and ice cream. For the others, everybody's welcome to come. And uh, for those who are welcome to come, certainly bring some finger foods for yourself and for others that will be there planning that as well. But again, that'll be a last to leader send-off party after the evening service two weeks from today, April the 17th. The last to leaders convention is the next weekend, which will be beginning April the 22nd. April the 22nd, that'll be on a Friday. Saturday and that Sunday. <clears throat> in connection with Last the Leaders, they will be conducting the Wednesday evening service, not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, April the 13th. The boys will conduct their presentations here in the auditorium. The girls will conduct their presentations in the fellowship hall. The ladies want to go back and hear the girls like we did last year. You're welcome to do that. The boys will conduct their presentations here in the auditorium for who those who wish to hear them, but certainly you will be quite impressed with the progress that all of our participants of Last to Leaders have made, and we're looking forward to that. This coming Saturday, Ladies' Day at Cedartown, the van will go, it begins at 9 o'clock, the van will leave here probably somewhere around 8.15ish, something like that, but the van will go to Ladies' Day next Saturday. Uh, Sister uh, Lee, Kalita Lee, I think, is the speaker there. Also, next Friday, April the 8th, is a gospel singing at Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Church of Christ in Jacksonville, Alabama, home of House to House, Heart to Heart. If you've ever been to a gospel singing there, it's a good one. So if you uh, wish to go to a good gospel singing, this is your best and great opportunity. We'll also take the van there. If you'd like to go, let us know so we'll know how to plan if you want to ride with us. That begins at 7 o'clock Central Time. We'll leave here at about 6.45 our time to get there and we should be there in plenty of time. 
gospel singing next Friday, April the 8th at Jacksonville Church of Christ, Jacksonville, Alabama. Next Saturday is the uh, baby shower for Julia Stevenson. Next Saturday at 2 p.m. at uh, mine and Tammy's home for the ladies who wish to attend that. And again, our congratulations to those from Bremen who participated in Villarica's Bible Bowl yesterday. The participants, Scott and Lauren Lloyd, Tate and Thad Williams, they came in a very close second, but they're all winners for participating, period. And there were several congregations that participated there. It wasn't a gimme. They had to study, and they did an excellent job. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left. If you'll be in the library, there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Should we mention anything else? Closing song is number 290, 290, Be With Me, Lord. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Let's bow and pray together.